Good morning. It's nice to see everyone in purple this morning. Very impressive crowd out there. I am Councilmember Helen Rosenthal, Chair of the Committee on Women. Before we get started, I do want to acknowledge that October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. This is a time to mourn victims, celebrate and empower survivors, and draw attention to the services, resources, and support there is for survivors. Earlier this morning, my colleagues on the council and I joined the mayor's office to end domestic and gender-based violence in celebrating Go Purple Day. We distributed materials about the city's family justice centers at subway stops throughout the city, raising awareness for the services and resources that the city has available to survivors. I'd like to thank Commissioner Noel and her office for their tremendous efforts every day, specifically today, though, in sponsoring Go Purple Day. And also a special shout out goes to Majority Leader Lori Cumbo, who blazed the trail for this important day at the council when she was chair of the Committee on Women. Last month, what was formerly known as the Office to Combat Domestic Violence became the Office to End Domestic and Gender-Based Violence, or NGBV, through Executive Order 36. This name change is not only aspirational in its aim to end domestic and gender-based violence, it is indicative of an expanded mission for the office. In addition to continuing its work on familial and intimate partner violence, NGBV is now tasked with coordinating the city's efforts against sexual assault, human trafficking, and stalking. Domestic and gender-based violence reflects serious and complex issues that can affect any New Yorkers, regardless of identity, women, men, transgender, and non-conforming individuals, and regardless of race, religion, and socioeconomic status. Inherent in these acts of violence are power dynamics which disproportionately harm the most vulnerable and marginalized among us. No one needs reminding that the current federal administration is stoking these flames. Last week's news from Trump's Twitter account threatening to undermine protections for trans and GNC people simply adds to his Twitter rages against women and immigrants. Compared to men, women are 4.5 times, four and a half times as likely to be victim of a domestic violence homicide. Compared to white women, black women are more likely to be the victim of domestic violence homicide. We don't currently have data on DV fatalities that include a breakdown by gender identity and sexual orientation, and that's something I look forward to discussing at today's hearing. The current crime trends across the city require us to ask ourselves whether we are appropriately allocating resources to fight domestic violence. As violent crime has steadily decreased, the reports of felony and misdemeanor domestic violence have increased over the past 10 years. The first line of a New York Times story that ran at the end of 2016 reads, as murders in New York City have declined significantly over the past 25 years, one category has remained stubbornly high, domestic violence homicides. Today they represent about 17% of all homicides. And so NGBV's expanded role is more important than ever. Today we will learn how NGBV views its mission and we will also consider four pieces of legislation that would enhance reporting, 
assess the results of NGBV's current efforts through the Family Justice Center via a client satisfa satisfaction survey, create potential opportunities to train cosmetologists to recognize signs of domestic violence, and provide survivors with access to legal representation so they are no longer financially obligated to remain married to their abusers. Together, these bills will ensure that the city is delivering resources and services to domestic and gender-based violence survivors in the most appropriate, strategic, and effective ways. We are grateful to have Commissioner Noel and the many advocacy organizations that are here to testify today. These are the experts on the complexity of domestic violence who are steeped in the work of piecing together the intersectionality. Let me say that one more time. These are the experts on the complexity of domestic violence who are steeped in the work of piecing together the intersectionality of gender, race, socioeconomic, sexual orientation, and the power dynamics in efforts to end gender and domestic-based violence. Um, I'd like to thank uh, the City Council staff here, Brenda McKinney, our General Counsel, Chloe Rivera, our Legislative Policy Analyst, and Daniel Krupp, our financial analyst and my new uh, director of legislation, Ned Terrace, um, who really helped pull together uh, this opening statement and the background work our office has done in understanding this complex issue. I want to acknowledge the members of the committee who are here today, Councilmember Lander from Brooklyn, and um, I'd like to ask Councilmember uh, Lanceman, who is the sponsor of one of these important pieces of legislation, to give an opening statement. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Councilman Rory Lanceman, Chair of the Committee on the Justice System, and I want to thank Councilmember Helen Rosenthal for leading this important hearing. During Domestic Violence Awareness Month, we reflect on the progress that has been made, and most importantly, on the work that we must continue to do to support domestic and gender-based violence survivors, increase public consciousness, and eradicate domestic and gender-based violence in our city. Unfortunately, domestic and gender-based violent crime rates have remained resistant to the steady reduction of the overall crime rate in this city, as Chairwoman Rosenthal mentioned. In 2017, the NYPD responded to over 108,000 intimate partner-related domestic incidents, a 16% increase from the previous year. The challenges that survivors face, from physical and emotional trauma to lost jobs and homelessness, are public issues that require policies and social services to help improve their lives. The Family Justice Centers, facilitated by the Mayor's Office to End Domestic and Gender-Based Violence, provide legal services, counseling, and support services for survivors. In 2017, these Family Justice Centers, located in each of the five boroughs, served 62,645 individuals, individuals. But what do the survivors think of the services that we provide them? My bill, Intro 542, would create a mechanism for clients to fill out satisfaction surveys after they receive domestic violence services from the Family Justice Centers. <coughs> Excuse me. The satisfaction surveys will not be mandatory and will remain anonymous. Survivors will be able to indicate which services are the most useful, which should be altered, and which changes the centers can make to better assist them. This will allow the Family Justice Centers and survivors to work collaboratively to improve services and set priorities. Again, I'd like to thank Chair Rosenthal for putting this hearing together, and I look forward to listening to the testimony today. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Councilmember Lansman. I'd like to welcome Councilmember Traeger to this hearing and ask him uh, to give an opening statement about his bill, Intro 1085. Thank you. Good morning. Um, first, I want to thank uh, Chair Rosenthal for holding today's important oversight hearing, as well as for taking the lead on New York City uh, Go Purple Day. As mentioned, October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, and I'm proud we as a city are raising awareness about domestic violence and providing services for survivors as we work to make sure all survivors know that they're not alone. Today we're hearing my bill, Introduction 1085, a local law to amend <clears throat> the administrative code of the city of New York in relation to providing legal services to victims of domestic violence in divorce proceedings. Your safety and your freedom shouldn't be determined by your income. No one should have to stay in an abusive marriage simply because they can't afford a divorce lawyer. My bill would require the Office of the Civil Justice Coordinator to establish programs to provide victims of domestic violence with full legal representation in divorce proceedings in civil Supreme Court. Full legal representation includes the payments of all filing fees. The bill would cover all victims and survivors of domestic violence, regardless of gender and regardless of whether there has been any type of conviction or criminal complaint. We know many victims of domestic violence are not always able to come forward to make a criminal complaint, and we wanna make sure they are protected too. As we know, domestic violence impacts all of our communities across the city. In May, the New York Times wrote an article called, Their Husbands Abuse Them, Shouldn't Divorce Be Easy? This article gave a harrowing insight into the struggle so many women face when they seek a divorce. With this bill, a mother can focus on her and her children's safety without having to worry about the cost of a divorce. Our city must take an important stand and do everything we can to support our domestic violence victims and survivors. And I want to share a very brief excerpt from that article where a mother and her two children were physically abused by her husband and she moved her family into a shelter. And she first tried to turn to private attorneys who estimated that the cost of representation would cost over $3,000 or more. She couldn't afford it. New York guarantees lawyers for poor people who can't afford them in a range of family court cases, including child custody and domestic violence proceedings, but divorce cases, even in the context of domestic violence, always occur in Supreme Court, and litigants do not have a right to counsel for the full case. New York took a bold step in providing free counseling for low-income New Yorkers facing eviction, which I think was the right thing to do, and we have a moral, moral obligation to make sure that there is no cost too high for someone's freedom in New York. And again, I want to thank Chair Rosenthal for holding this very important hearing. Thank you. Thank you much, uh, so much, Councilmember Traeger, and I want to recognize Councilmember Ayala, who represents both Northern Manhattan and Southern Bronx, uh, for joining us today. Um, and I'd like to turn it over now to my committee council. I'm going to read the oath. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Okay, thank you. I just want to be clear that it was purposeful that I did not read that statement, although other chairs do. Mm -hmm. um, I have complete faith in your office and in you, Commissioner, and I. I can't tell you how, uh, I can tell you that uh, the city is lucky to have you. Thank you, thank you. Okay, good morning, Chairperson Rosenthal, Councilmember Lansman, 
Councilman Mo Traeger, and other members of the, of the council. I am Cecile Noel, Commissioner for the Mayor's Office to End Domestic and Gender-Based Violence. Thank you for the opportunity <coughs> excuse me, to speak with you about the office's reports, client satisfaction surveys at the Family Justice Centers, domestic violence-related training for professionals, and matrimonial legal assistance for survivors of domestic violence. I am pleased to be joined by my colleague, Jordan Dressler, the City uh, Civil Justice Coordinator at HRA's Office of Civil Justice, or OCJ, who is here to answer any questions the Council may have regarding Intro 1085. On September 7th, 2018, Mayor Bill de Blasio signed Executive Order 36, which expanded the authorities and responsibilities of the Mayor's Office to Combat Domestic Violence and changed the name of OCDV to the Mayor's Office to End Domestic and Gender-Based Violence, or NGBV. The Office to End Domestic and Gender-Based Violence will continue to develop and coordinate citywide response to intimate partner and family violence and now has the expanded authority to address gender-based violence, including sexual assault, stalking, and trafficking, as well as the continuum and intersection of these issues. We will also continue to create bridges across criminal justice and social services to coordinate New York City's approaches and system responses to ensure that all survivors have streamlined access to, inclusive and crit to, to the inclusive and critical resources and services. I am proud to be part of this administration's strong commitment and unprecedented investment to enhance the city's response to domestic and gender-based violence. During this administration, we have, among other things, opened two new family justice centers, expanded domestic violence shelter capacity, and launched new initiatives focused on public housing, domestic violence, stalking, healthy relationship education for youth in foster care, and other vulnerable youth increased access to mental health services for survivors, and launched a new policy and training institute within NGBV to end domestic violence, uh, to, to expand domestic violence education for city agencies and community-based organizations. In addition, the city has recently invested $11 million in domestic violence programming and initiatives through the Mayor's Domestic Violence Task Force and $3 million through the Interrupting Violence at Home Initiative to develop innovative programming to working with abusive partners. With the implementation of the Office to End Domestic and Gender-Based Violence, we are continuing to respond as a city to the voices of survivors and advocates and recognizing the need for a system-wide coordinated response to these issues. The new office will seek to implement best practices and policies, develop and strengthen services and intervention initiatives, enhance coordination across agencies and disciplines, and employ methods for data and information sharing. The office will continue to operate the Domestic Violence Fatality Review Committee and will also operate the Advisory Committee to review individual case-level data on domestic violence and gender-based fatalities. The office will also continue to operate the New York City Family Justice Centers, which are walk-in multi-service centers in each borough for survivors to access free, confidential services and support. Key city agencies, community partners, civil legal service providers, and district attorney's offices are located on site at the FJC to make it easier for survivors to get help. FJCs welcome people of all incomes, ages, sexual orientations, gender identities, regardless of the language they speak or their immigration status. Last year, the FJCs had over 62,000 client visits across the boroughs. The expansion of our mission is a multi-stage process that begins with feedback and information gathering from advocates, community stakeholders, and survivors that will inform our advocacy efforts and recommendations for policies, programming, data, and best practices citywide. In addition, NGBV will continue to advocate for and explore additional programming for survivors in New York City. 
We have a strong relationship with providers, advocates, community stakeholders across the city, and believe it is imperative to provide them with access to information, research, data, as well as information about programming operated and overseen by NGBV. In the last few years, we have expanded our research and evaluation work. And in the last two years, we have released the following reports, which are all publicly available and accessible via our website and on NYC Open Data. 2017 fact sheet, the 2017 annual report, 2017 and 18 fatality review committee reports, 2017 intimate partner violence community board snapshots, the 2017 family, family related violence community uh, board snapshots, 2017 goals and recommendations for the New York City Domestic Violence Task Force. Some of the metrics captured in these reports and fact sheets include the number of clients assisted at each of the fa five family justice centers, along with the total number of visits, the number of individuals trained by NGBV staff, the number of Healthy Relationship Training Academy workshops conducted, and the number of youth participants in those workshops, the number of outreach events conducted by NGBV, the total annual calls made to the city's domestic violence hotline. We also released 10 research briefs and reports in 2017 and 18 on a variety of topics related to intimate partner violence to assist New Yorkers in understanding the issues and encourage further conversations, including OCDV in focus, survey findings from New York City Healthy Relationship Training Academy, participation in the academy leads to significant improvement in the knowledge and attitudes around healthy relationships. This is a summary of the results of pre and post workshop surveys conducted by the New York City Healthy Relationship Training Academy. News coverage of intimate partner homicides um, in, in New York City, a systematic review of all a, a review of all the news articles reporting on intimate partner violence homicides from 2013 through 16. Brief data, uh, brief data, intimate partner uh, homicide suicide in New York City uh, from 2010 through 2017. A descriptive analysis of New York City's homicides in which the abusive partner partner murdered. Uh, murdered their, their current or former intimate partner and then died by suicide. OCDV in focus, a closer look at foreign born clients visiting the New York City Family Justice Centers. This is an overview of the foreign born client population of the Family Justice Centers, showing that the majority of Family Justice Center clients are foreign born and that the client base reflects the diversity of New York City's population. We aim to continue releasing periodic reports and briefs about pertinent topics to inform New Yorkers about these issues, as well as ensure access to data and programming updates through our office's annual reports and fact sheets. While the city, proposes, uh, uh, while the city opposes the current version of Intro 351, we look forward to discussing a version of the bill that is aligned with our available data and metrics responsive to what advocates and providers are seeking without placing an unintended burden on, con on contracted providers and, the, and that provides an overview of NGBV operations and programs. <coughs> Excuse me. In addition to expanding our outputs in regard to research and reports, in the last few years we've also started to evaluate programming operated by NGBV, as well as programming that we are partnering on with other agencies. In November 2016, NGBV collaborated with the Mayor's Office of Economic Opportunity, NYC Opportunity, to contract with ABT Associates to conduct an evaluation of the Brooklyn uh, Queens, Bronx, and Manhattan FJCs, specifically focusing on the effective uh, uh, interagency collaboration provision, um, a, a provision of efficient and effective service delivery, and client satisfaction. Staten Island was not included in this evaluation because it was still in its first year of operation. This evaluation was completed in 2017 and was the first ever evaluation of the New York City FJCs. The evaluation found the following. 
Administrative and, and, and partner staff at the four FJCs believe the FJC model is successful. The majority of administrative and partner staff believe the FJCs are collaborative. The FJCs promote an increased knowledge um, of other partner staff and create relationships between staff and most importantly, clients are very happy with the services they receive at the FJC and believe that their needs are being met. In November 2017, NGBV held meetings at each of the FJCs with on-site provider staff and also met with the leadership and supervisors of our, com our partner community-based organizations and presented the evaluation findings. During these meetings, we sought feedback from partners regarding how best to address the evaluation findings and discuss some of the changes that, that, we were, already being, that, that were already being implemented. Although the evaluation findings were overwhelmingly positive, there are targeted areas where NGBV will be looking to enhance collaboration service delivery at the FJCs. One of the key outcomes of the evaluation was the creation of a survivor ad advisory group for NGBV, which will allow those who have experienced domestic and gender-based violence a venue to have input in the policies, procedures, and services. The Voices Survivor Group was established earlier this year and will help us to identify potential service issues as well as determine the need for additional services. In addition, the centers have been and will continue to implement new initiatives to ensure that the FJCs are providing efficient and effective services to survivors in a collaborative and supportive environment. To help support that work, we will be holding follow-up meetings with FJC provider staff, implementing FJC client satisfaction survey, surveys, and getting systematic feedback from our voices group. The city supports the goal of intro 542, and it is closely aligned with the work we are doing to enhance mechanisms for client feedback that can help to guide improvements to overall service delivery and, environment, and, and the environment at the, F, at the FJCs, such as we look forward to, and, and as such, we look forward to discussing this further. One of the services offered at the family justice centers and in community-based organizations throughout the city is civil legal assistance, including matrimonial legal assistance. With regard to intro 1085, we agree with the principle embodied in this legislation and that the lack of financial means should not stand in the way of a domestic violence survivors having access to high quality legal services. To that end, we would welcome an opportunity to work with our partners at the Human Resources Administration, Office of Civil Justice, as well as with providers, advocates, and fellow city agencies, the courts, and the council to explore the best ways in which to increase access to these services. In order to ensure that such a program is successful, much more information is needed to better understand the needs and costs associated with providing proposed services, the proposed services in this legislation, as well as a realistic time frame. We look forward to continuing this discussion with the city council and other stakeholders to determine the most effective and efficient ways to provide greater access to these important services to survivors of domestic violence. In the spring of 2016, NGBV launched a new policy and training institute. The institute includes a policy team, a training team, and the New York City Healthy Relationship Training Academy, and leads NGBV's training and prevention work. It, is, it, it was created to enhance the city, the, it was created to enhance the city agency and community-based organizations response to these issues of domestic and gender-based violence, identify key areas for policy change and development, and engage in primary prevention work, uh, work with young people throughout New York City. In 2017, the training team conducted 287 trainings to more than uh, 6,759 participants, including city agencies, community-based organizations, providers, and community stakeholders. Providing Commissioner, free I'm going to ask you to pause for one minute. I want to thank the sergeant for closing the doors uh, to the outside hallway where uh, uh, there were people who were talking to your, during your testimony, 
and it was a little bit hard to okay, hear. So I want to thank him for that, and I want to remind uh, the council members here um, uh, um, how important it is to to hear what you're saying. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. In 2017, the training team conducted 287 trainings to more than 6,757 participants, including city agencies, community-based organizations, providers, and community stakeholders, uh, providing free educational and professional development opportunities for frontline staff and community partners to enhance their engagement with survivors of domestic and gender-based violence. In addition, the training team provided technical assistance to those organizations to support their current policies, protocols to address domestic and gender-based violence. In 2017, the Academy conducted 743 free healthy relationship workshops and trainings with over 13,000 youth parents and professional staff participants in the schools and in schools and community settings. In 2017, nine new offerings were added to the training team and academy curriculum ca catalog, including intimate partner sexual violence, trauma-informed practices, impact of intimate partner violence on children, and navigating healthy sexual relationships. The Institute also hosts large conferences and convenings, which provide additional professional development opportunities on these issues that are free and open to provider staff in a myriad of industry sectors across New York City, including healthcare, education, and media. The training team recent, recently launched a partnership with Voices, um, Voices of Women Organizing, or VOW. To bring, survive, to bring the survivor's perspective into this work. The feedback from VAL will inform the training team's work as it continues to adapt and enhance and expand its trainings. With, ex with our expanded mission and new subject areas, NGBV will continue to build out our training topic areas and will explore new mechanisms to access our training and professional development programming. Most importantly, through, through potential web-based training opportunities. We are currently working with the Thrive Leadership Team and the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene to develop a 45-minute online module on recognizing and responding to intimate partner violence, or IPV, for, for the city's online Thrive Learning Center. Once it is launched, this free introductory module will be available to all New Yorkers. We strongly support the aim of Intro 371A to explore mechanisms and resources to, to explore the mechanisms and resources needed to expand the reach of our training and education efforts through web-based tools that should be broad and wide-reaching. And are, and are interested in continuing to explore how we can use technology to reach large, larger audiences and create greater accessibility across disciplines to, to the trainings that we offer. The trainings are critical to not only providing professional, develop professional development to staff working with survivors and offender populations, but also to enhance the awareness about these issues and build capacity in communities to identify domestic and gender-based violence and share resources with survivors. However, we are concerned about placing an enhanced responsibility on cosmetologists who may not have the expertise in serving survivors of abuse by requiring that they receive targeted training to identify and respond to domestic violence. We look forward to discussing with the council how we can collaborate to enhance our training efforts and engage with residents across the city. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on, this, on these issues and I welcome any questions you might, and any questions that the committee might have. Thank you so much, Commissioner. I want to welcome other committee members, uh, Bill um, Ben Kalos from Manhattan, and I'm going to turn it over to the uh, sponsors of uh, to the piece of legislation to get us started. Councilmember Lansman. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see you again. I think the last time I saw you was at the Family Justice Center in, right. in Queens a few that weeks ago. That is correct, yes. We're very proud of the Family Justice Centers, very grateful for the work that they do, and very supportive of uh, the administration's efforts to 
make them as strong and, and successful as possible. Hello. Um, I naturally want to focus on, on my bill, uh, which would provide for client satisfaction surveys. I see in your testimony that your office has done some surveying of clients. Yes. Um, and specifically, it says in November 2016, you collaborated with um, others, mayor's offices, uh, with, I guess, a consulting company, yes, ABT right. Associates, to conduct an evaluation of the Brooklyn, Queens, Bronx, and Manhattan FJCs, uh, specifically focusing on effective interagency collaboration, provision of efficient and effective service delivery, and client satisfaction. So could you tell us how um, ABT Associates uh, uh, gauged client satisfaction, what tools they used, and, and then we can talk about what their findings might have been. Okay, so what, what they essentially did was they engaged in a multi-pronged process that was one, surveying our providers, looking at our services, looking at our intake forms, um, actually holding focus groups with providers, with staff, and as, as well as survivors. And, and really collaborated that, or, or really compiled that into um, a response that really gave us information on how, one, one, what were we doing and was it effective, and how could we really improve those services. So it was a combination of all of the above, which also included um, focus groups with clients as well. So, so the mechanism for evaluating or for determining whether clients were satisfied with the services they received uh, was focus survey, groups survey and focus groups the survey the survey was a was a questionnaire yes the paper questionnaire yes do, do you know many how many how many clients were surveyed through I, that questionnaire I can actually get back to you on that I don't have that information but we can certainly get back to you with the number on that good and could you share with us the uh, the, the a copy of the survey so we just see what questions were asked yes great and um, in addition to the surveys there were focus groups of yes. clients? Yes. Do, do you know how many focus groups were conducted? We can get back to you. Okay. okay. That's fine. Good. Um, and then I see elsewhere in your testimony that we will be holding follow-up meetings with FJC, Family Justice Center provider staff, implementing Family Justice Center client satisfaction surveys and getting systematic feedback from the voices groups. So what kind of uh, uh, client satisfaction surveys and other mechanisms are you planning to, 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 to gauge um, client satisfaction, separate and apart from, from what my bill would do? What we were looking at were basically some of the areas that were pointed out from our independent uh, evaluation of our services. So we were clearly looking at how can we make our intake process a little bit easier? How can we streamline our questions? Sorry, but right. <coughs> before we get into the, the meat of it, I just want to understand the mechanism. I, is, it, is it your plan to, to continue with these surveys or, or, or different surveys, these, these written, written um, surveys, or are you going to continue with fo focus groups? What, what's the mechanism that, that you have in your mind for gauging client satisfaction? The mechanism that I think that I have and that we've talked about with the team is really looking at a, a survey that would be an actual yeah. paper survey. But, but I think that we also learn a lot from our focus group, which is why we have the voices, which is why we're looking for more client input. So um, I envision that in addition to that, that the voices group will help that, and that we might also feel a need to bring in clients and engage in focus groups okay. as we so, go forward. Okay. So, so let's talk about um, the substance of what these client surveys and focus groups found. What were clients happy with? What were they unhappy with? What, what areas were suggested for, uh, for improvement or change? One of the things that I, I, I think that we are looking at very cl closely are the, are the numbers of questions that we ask at intake and how can we streamline that process a little bit easier. I think clients told us that they found that to be kind of cumbersome at the beginning. You know, we go through a lot of questions, and to be able to streamline that, because often those questions are sometimes asked again when they get to maybe a civil, uh, get to an attorney or get to a case manager also. So we're trying to look at how we can capture the information maybe once and, be, and, and maybe be able to transfer that a little more seamlessly than, than we do right now. 
Um, we're also looking at how staff can better coordinate around the delivery because uh, client information is really important, but we also need to ensure that staff have all the information that they need to be able to work with uh, survivors as well. And so any survey process that we intake will be yes about uh, the, our, our, our clients coming in and, and the services that they need, but how well staff working in, in that center also feel that, um, that they're meeting the needs of survivors and, and communication is going well. So it, it's, it's on both sides, which I think is very important. Mm -hmm. Were there other areas that clients indicated, uh, I don't want to say dissatisfaction necessarily, mm -hmm. but that would suggest areas of improvement or things to look at? Well, um, one of the things that, um, that we've seen, um, which we're doing now in Queens, is that our clients often have multiple areas that they, that they experience violence. And so we call it poly-victimization, that it's not just intimate partner violence, they could have sexual assault and they might have trafficking, they could have other areas. And how can we better get that assessment up front? How can we better know that information initially so that we can pull that into the service plan in a more comprehensive way? and, and trauma-informed um, um, work that we do with, with clients. Do you know if, um, how the consulting firm went about uh, offering the, the surveys to folks? Was it over the course of a week everyone was offered a survey or, or through some other mechanism or selection process? We can get back to you with the whole process of how the survey was done. This is almost a year now, so I want to be able to be sure that we're giving you all of the answers that you need. But it was over it was over multiple months. This was not a week, it was over time. And so I'd like to get back to you with the answer to okay. those questions. And then in terms of my specific bill and your testimony, you mentioned that you're you're open to it. Obviously mm -hmm. you are mm -hmm. open to the idea of, of doing surveys and um, I guess you'd like to talk about it further. Is there anything that you could tell us today that, that strikes you um, about uh, my bill that, that might be uh, an issue in your, in, your, in your mind? I think we'd like to just discuss that with you further. I, we'd like, I, we definitely support the intent and feel that it's an important part of our work, and so we, we support that, but we'd like to get back to you with the specifics on what we think uh, could be adjusted in the bill. You don't mind that. Good, good. Okay, well, let's do that. I look forward to it. I'm, I'm glad to hear that you are, or this is already in your mind, and, and you've done some of this, uh, this outreach to, to clients as, as well. At the end of the day, as you don't need me to, to, to tell you, uh, we're doing all of this to, to meet their needs, and we want to make sure that we're, we're doing it as, as well as possible. Okay. So I look forward to sitting down with you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, Council Member. Council Member Traeger. Um, as a bill sponsor, I'm turning over to you next. I also want to welcome Majority Leader Lori Cumbo, who um, really spearheaded, in my mind's eye, the City Council's efforts around Gold Purple Day, set the, set the bar very high. Um, so thank you for that. And just a reminder to everyone uh, here that we have a hard stop at 1 o'clock uh, for this hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Rosenthal. Uh, Thank you, Commissioner, for your testimony. And uh, for, just for the sake of clarity, what is the exact position of the, of the administration on introduction to 85? I think it's in my testimony that we certainly support the intent on, and, and that we would like to be able to look at this issue a little further, both with the Human Resources Administration and our partner at the Office of uh, Civil Justice, partners and providers to better understand really the scope and need for these services. Uh, Commissioner, has your office uh, received requests for assistance uh, to afford divorce lawyers uh, for uh, divorce proceedings that are related to domestic violence, whether they came directly to your office or to providers that we work with? Um, I can tell you about what we see in the family justice centers, which I want to caution you is just a, a portion of the, the world of survivors and, and services. So in the family justice centers, when we look at 2018, um, we had a little over 1,100 uh, requests for matrimonial or, or lawyers were dealing with matrimonial issues. 
So in 2018? Yes, that is correct. 1,100 requests? Approximately, approximately. Clients, clients that were assisted with matrimonial issues. Uh, and you have data from last year as well? Or? I don't have that with me, but we can certainly uh, pull that data. Right. Uh, now, what does the administration currently suggest survivors do For, when uh, they are seeking freedom uh, from abusive marriages? So for those specifics on, on this particular bill, I would like uh, Jordan Dressler to come to the table and maybe talk with us about that since it falls really under the Human Resources Administration's Office of Civil Justice. Please, go ahead. Uh, thank you. I'm Jordan Dressler. I'm the Civil Justice Coordinator uh, with uh, the Human Resources Administration's Sorry. Office uh, Jordan, of Civil Justice. Can you hang one minute? I'm going to turn it over to my legal counsel. Got to do that. Yes, of course. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to the council member questions? Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, my name is Jordan Dressler. I'm the Civil Justice Coordinator. Um, in answer to your question, Council Member, uh, there are a number of ways that survivors uh, can receive access to services. Obviously, the Family Justice Centers throughout the city are uh, one of the main touch points for the city to provide a range of services, including civil legal services, uh, as well as the Domestic Violence Hotline, which is also a way to get access to services. Uh, every day, um, providers that the city works with uh, are providing these important services, the scale of which and the remaining needs of which is something that we're very interested in looking into. Uh, again, just to reiterate, uh, we do uh, share the concern and uh, really embrace the principle that there should be increased access for survivors of domestic and intimate partner violence to important matrimonial legal services. Um, the contours of that and what precisely that ought to look like is something that's going to require quite a bit of more study. Um, we need to look at questions of existing needs and existing uh, available services. Uh, what the capacity of the legal services field uh, amongst our nonprofit legal provider community looks like in terms of growth and capacity for growth. Uh, distribution across boroughs, distribution across courts. We are well aware that the controversies that happen between uh, spouses um, and the, the areas in which uh, survivors can be victimized uh, play out in Supreme Court, but also play out in family court. And so understanding the interplay between those two venues is critical to ensuring that uh, if we are to increase access, that that access is meaningful that growth is thoughtful and intentional. Um, it's a process that we want to engage in. Uh, it's a conversation that we're happy to be having, both with the council uh, and with the uh, provider and advocate community. Right, and, and I appreciate that, but you are aware that divorce proceedings occur in Supreme Court, not in family court. Yes. Is that correct? Is that correct? Yes, that is. And currently, with all the services that are being provided, and, and we do appreciate them, that is limited. It does not extend to free legal representation in Supreme Court for divorce cases that are related to, to domestic violence. Is that correct? The state law does not extend to matrimonial work in Supreme Court. R right, the state law, but nothing prohibits the city from not taking a step here forward. Is that correct? Nothing legally. Nothing legally. Uh, so just to answer my question just practically and basically to summarize. What does the city currently tell survivors? What do we tell them now today? If someone walks into the office and says, I can't afford a lawyer, what do we tell them today? I think in most cases we're referring to one of the network of service providers, which includes legal services uh, that the city through various agencies contracts with. And I think what remains to be better understood is where the gaps remain after that process happens. 
as well as uh, how effective is the outreach and the, uh, you know, the sort of information uh, around those services? I mean, I think that there is, and I welcome the opportunity to work together on this, but I think there is a plethora of information, I think, out there already. Uh, there are domestic violence shelters. There are uh, folks who have stepped forward to come to the office. Um, and because let me just kind of elaborate what I mean by folk, by survivors seeking their freedom. There are a number of things that they are seeking their freedom from. Obviously from an abusive relationship, abusive marriage, the trauma that travels with that. But also if they are working, gain employment, have a pension, there are still legal ties to that partner. There are even, there are significant costs associated with even finding and locating the abusive partner, trying to bring them to court. Their filing fees are cost prohibitive. There are also health care ramifications because technically the spouse is still a health care proxy, can be a health care proxy. Someone who has hurt you physically could still make decisions on your behalf about your health. That's outrageous. So, and just for their sake of peace of mind, for their children, for their family. So I, I welcome the opportunity to work together. I think that there are a number of stakeholders and providers that will be more than willing to work with us on this. And again, I repeat, for the city of New York, there is no cost too great to ensure the safety and freedom of these brave and courageous survivors. And I welcome the opportunity to work together. And I thank you, Chair, for your, for your time. Sorry. Uh, are you finished, Councilmember? Thank you so much. Um, um, I want to welcome, um, no, nope. uh, Councilmember Salamanca and ask him in a minute if he's ready to give an opening statement. But I just want to ask very quickly, when you review the fatality, when you're doing the fatality reviews, what jumps out at you as uh, important connectors? And I'm not getting at um, what the city's doing right or wrong. That's not the intent of my question. It's more uh, like, is there a correlation between the number of times that somebody com calls the police to get help? Is that a correlation to, uh, at the end of the day, you know, a homicide? Or what are the fact, what are the common denominators? Well, what we found over the years is that uh, a good number of the fatalities actually had contact with the city agency in some yep. way. Um, and that's important, and that's led to us looking at procedures within city agencies around uh, survivors, their domestic violence policies, as well as what training can we provide to improve that overall res staff's response um, uh, to survivors when they present. So that was- uh, Can you give one specific example? Um, of, of training, of... Well, um, here's what, in my mind's eye, I'm thinking about, like, where are the greatest uh, agency connectors? Is it NYPD or, F, or, or the FJCs? Actually, I, I can give you an example of one of the training. We've been doing an extensive amount of training with ACS. Uh, because we know that often uh, we've seen that not only um, is there a child protection case, there's also a DV issue. So we've been working closely to improve the staff's understanding of domestic violence, their response within the context of a child protection case, but also understanding those nuances as well. And DHS, we have really looked at um, both having uh, staff within that system better understand the dynamics, how to respond, what to do, how to connect this survivor to the, nest, be it an FJC, uh, to other services, to looking at how they can engage in safety planning when incidents happen within that system. Yeah, that's exactly what I was getting at. So thank you very much for that. In, and I trust that in those meetings that's exactly the type of thing that's going on. Yes. Do you, and do you report on aggregate information of yes, that in your report? Yes, you do. Yes, we okay. do. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Councilmember Salamanca, do you want to give a short 
opening statement. Yeah, I'll and just a few first. Questions. I want to thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, and Commissioner, it's great seeing you again. Um, I'm sorry for my tardiness. Um, I know that we're deep in the conversation, and I um, just want to open up by saying, you know, how important uh, today's hearing is, especially uh, um, with it being uh, New York City Go Purple Day um, and uh, Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Um, I'm a big supporter of helping organizations, especially domestic violence organizations, actually get funding and ensuring that they're providing services uh, within the appropriate locations where uh, we have young adults who, in my opinion, that's where domestic violence may start, whether it's happening at home and they're seeing this and they may think that it's accept acceptable, or they're in their first relationship and they encounter some type of domestic violence from their partner and continue on with that relationship thinking that is acceptable. Um, and when you look at um, my allocations for DUB funding, I normally focus on uh, providing funding to organizations that can provide this type of training to our young adults, to our adolescents. Mm -hmm. um, so today we're hearing a bill in which I introduced intro 371A, which would require the mayor's office to end domestic violence and gender-based violence to offer training to cosmetologists, including hairstylists, barbers, manicurists, waxers, and so on and so forth. And um, in having conversations with my colleague, uh, you know, I, um, we, I got this idea and I'm so passionate about it, you know, I really don't have much hair on top of my head, you know, but I do go try to get a trimming of my beard um, at least twice a week or once a week. And, and you know, going to the same barbershop for over, you know, close to 20 years now, um, you know, in, in barbershops, you hear things, you know, um, and yes, you know, we, we talk about sports, we talk about, most of the time we talk about our families, our children, but at times, you know, that barber is, is, is having that one-on-one -on -one relationship with you. He, he is, you have an intimate time with that barber, and at times, you're, um, you're sharing an intimate experience with your barber. And I, uh, and I feel that this, this build is, it, for me, in my opinion, I guess for, for guys, it, it, it really hits home where you may have a client, you being a borrower, you may have a client who is experiencing some difficulties and he may experience that it may lead to domestic violence. And, you know, that's the opportunity for that barber to give him information as to where he can seek help. Because uh, we all know, you know, the road that you go through when you do, uh, you, you interact with domestic violence. You know, you can get arrested. Uh, you can, um, there can be an uh, order of protection from your family. Now you're away from your family. And it can really destroy your entire life. Um, so in my opinion, I, do I have your support for this, for this bill? I'm, do you have a second? Um, you, we definitely support the aim of 371A. Um, however, I would also like to say that we have taken great pains over the last two years to create um, a training academy to really target and look at how we can broaden our reach in terms of understanding the overall city's understanding, people's understanding of the issue of intimate partner violence. And that training should be available to anyone, and so we support that. What we don't see or believe is that it needs to be targeted. There's no targeted training for cosmetologists. It's the general training that we offer to understand IPV. I think it's also important to understand that we do extensive outreach to salons and barbershops through, through our overall outreach arm. And we've been doing that for the last two years, and what we bring to those outreach events are really resources so they understand how, if someone discloses, where to refer them. That's what they need. They need to understand, one, how, how, to, how to listen, and, how, and what resources are there, and how to refer people. And that's what we do in this training. So that's also really important. And we also have an online portal, which is NYC Hope, where anyone can go and access services, dom dom domestic violence services across the city. They can see what's available. We truly support you in the belief that training is important. And we want to do more of it, and we want to do online online is wonderful, and we want to do more of that. 
Um, but what we don't see is some targeted training to cosmetologists that would be any different than the training that I would give you or any of the council members about understanding and then being able to refer. Well, you know, when, I, when we're talking about targeted training, I agree, it's the same training that we would receive, but it's targeting it's uh, that specialty. You know, one of my biggest concerns in ensuring that this bill is enforced is that an earlier version of my bill, there was a fine for those who failed to get trained. Uh, but I removed it so that it wouldn't be a burden on the cosmetologist with a monetary penalty. Now, my question is, could a solution be reporting the numbers of trained cosmetologists by borough? How do, how do we get your office, should this bill pass, to comply and ensuring that cosmetologists, barbers, individual barbers with licenses that they get from the city of New York. So, because I know that we have that data, they have a license, it's tracked. How do we get that information to you so that your office can go to these individual shops and train these individuals? What I would love to do is to sit down with you and your office to really look at the bill, look at how we can work together to um, reach some consensus on what we think would be important meeting your mission and also with our available resources. Clearly, we both believe that training is important and we do, we do. So how, how do we then structure something that, that's within our ability as an office to be able to do and also um, reach the population that you're talking about? So that's what we'd like to do. We'd like to sit down with you and really talk about the bill. Okay, all right, I'll, I'll uh, come back to the next round, thank you. Thank you so much, Council Member. Um, we have five panels uh, waiting to, uh, um, to give testimony today, uh, many advocacy groups and lawyers, and I just want to respect their time as well. And for that reason, I'm going to ask the council members who are not sponsors of the bill uh, to, to please try to stay within a three-minute time limit. Um, the, if the sergeant in arms could, could help with that. And I have council members Lander, Ayala, and Kalos asking questions. Thank you very much, Chair, and uh, happy birthday. Thank you for giving your birthday to focusing on this really critical uh, issue. Uh, and to the majority leader for helping lead the council on it as well, and to all the work, Commissioner, that you and your team do. Um, it's critical, and, and I'm glad we're having the hearing. Um, I'm gonna just ask a couple of questions about um, Councilmember Traeger's Bill 1085, and I think it's really great to see in the spirit that we worked hard to provide universal access to counsel for low-income tenants in housing court, to immigrants facing uh, deportation or other charges in immigration court, that this bill is really in that uh, tradition, and I'm honored that our council is thinking about how we expand access. Um, you know, um, uh, Mr. Dressler, I know you've done good work in the past uh, to design really thoughtful studies in a good time-bound way that help us get to the goal. Sometimes when we hear we're interested in studying that, what we hear is that'll take forever and it'll be, so in this case, in both those instances, you guys really worked with us to quickly move together to expand access. So, you know, do you have some work underway that can help uh, make that happen uh, quickly? And I guess I'll just ask all my, all my questions. Um, I want to understand how we're thinking about who the providers would be. I know there's already some providers uh, in the family justice centers, and of course what we want in these cases is to make sure that really strong nonprofit providers with good track record who understand the issues are the ones that provide the legal representation. We don't just wind up like throwing money out to private providers who would be glad to represent <laughs> people but wouldn't necessarily provide the representation in the ways that we want. And, and how do we make sure um, that access is thoughtful, so people who might not be inclined to seek it or know they're eligible can get it, but also we don't expose people to having at the very front door to, you know, to have to talk about um, issues that should be kept in, you know, thoughtful and confidential ways. So uh, really want to get to this goal and make sure we can do it together thoughtfully. Um, I can answer this. Um, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Council Member. Those are uh, very incisive questions, and I'll take the last two as a pair. Um, with regards to sort of who would do this work, I think we do share the, the intention of uh, exploring the opportunities with our community of nonprofit legal providers. Um, 
you know, as the civil justice coordinator, I get to work with terrific organizations and such a robust infrastructure of legal service providers in the city across a variety of fields, many times the same organizations serving New Yorkers in a variety of venues and a variety of subject matters. Um, that is critical, and it's critical to the success that I think we've all shared so far in a variety of areas. It's something that we would have every intention of continuing and uh, not throwing a bunch of money out the door to, you know, who knows who. Um, uh, that also leads to a provider uh, community that's going to approach this in a trauma-informed way. Um, so to the extent there is increased access, it's increased thoughtful and uh, uh, sensitive access uh, so that front door is open to, uh, uh, to them. You know, I'm, I apologize. We now have six panels uh, of, <laughs> of individuals who are interested. So I assume the questions will be answered uh, to the satisfaction of the council members. Uh, council Member Ayala. Thank you, Madam Chair, and happy birthday. <laughs> um, and thank you, Commissioner. Um, I think my, it's not, I don't have a, a question, but more of a, of a statement. And I think, you know, today I'm sitting here and I'm like trembling myself because this is a very emotional um, committee hearing and uh, an emotional day for many of us who are survivors of domestic violence. But I'm an, I am a, a, a co-sponsor of Intro 1085. And I would, what I will say to the city is that it's 2018 and you need to make this a priority. I was married when I was 18 years old and it took me almost 20 years to get out of that marriage. It was a very abusive marriage. And prior to 2010, in New York State, you couldn't get divorced because you had to prove that you were a victim of domestic violence by showing three clear examples of ways in which you were abused. By then, I had already separated from my abuser and um, enough time had passed that I no longer had enough of a valid a ra reason for wanting that divorce based on that abuse because we had been separated for enough time. I then had to prove, my other option was to prove abandonment, but then I also, then that warranted that I also proved that I tried everything in, you know, in my power to get this man to take me back. It was humiliating, it was exhausting, and it took Governor Patterson in 2010 to finally change the law that would allow me the right to seek a divorce based on no fault. And then it took me another three years to save the money that I needed to pay the measly $400 fee to get that divorce done and over with. I don't understand, it's not a lot of money. I think it was a combined $730, and I still have the receipts to prove in my closet, that allowed me the freedom to get out of this horrible, horrible relationship that was with me for far longer than I wanted it to be. And so I don't understand how in 2018, we're still having a conversation about where we could make you know, these funds available and how this could happen. And I mean, we pay billions into programs that, you know, we all believe in and causes that are important to all of us. And this, this, is a, this is an issue that saves lives. I can tell you the day that I walked out of there when I signed that divorce paper and my ex-husband was walking out one door and I was walking out the other, we were both crying. And we were both crying for different reasons. I was crying because I was free. He was crying because he lost his control over me. And it's important, so we need to do better. We need to do better and thank you. Thank you, council member, because it wasn't until I heard you today that it really brought it back. And it's been many, many, many years for me. And it's still every now and then triggered by events like this. And it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. It's 2018. We need to do better. So thank you. Council member Ayala. <laughs> We need people on the council who have lived experiences. We need people like you on the city council, people who have lived experiences who can bring with that deep passion and knowingness in your bones how important these issues are. And uh, I'm just so grateful to you
Uh, Councilmember Kalos, that is a tough act to follow. Uh, but uh, did you have some questions? I wanted to just thank uh, Diana for sharing her personal story, and I hope it will inspire other people in a similar situation to fight to get out of a bad situation and bring that fight to City Hall where they can continue that fight as co-chair of the Progressive Caucus and it is a privilege and honor to serve with you. I wanted to ask uh, the uh, Commissioner, mm -hmm. Commissioner Noel mm -hmm. specifically mm -hmm. around training, education and resources and outcomes. Specifically, it seems as a, a victim of harassment, the outcomes still sometimes feel like things might actually be getting worse uh, than previously with a criminal justice system that seems unable, inadequate, and unwilling to protect victims of harassment. And uh, key pieces just being, in certain cases, your best outcome is an order of protection, which may be six months or two years, but in all cases, you spend your time being confronted by somebody who has caused you harm in the past and is continuing to cause you harm. And the emotional time, having to take time off of work, risking employment because of court date after court date with a court system that will give the abuser as many adjournments as they want, and ultimately support in dealing with district attorneys who are just as likely to write a violation to the victim as to the perpetrator. And I'm just curious how your office can support victims throughout every step of the process so that they are able to go in, eyes open, knowing exactly what is, how, how difficult every step is, and then whether or not you're prepared to actually support people through it and help people keep their jobs when an abuser's decided that they're going to show up at their place of employment until they get that person terminated. Okay. Um, thank you for that question. I'd like to begin, uh, if I could just take a moment. Council Member Ayala, thank you so much for sharing that story. Uh, you, you give voice to so many survivors and so many of the struggles that we know that survivors face every day. And um, collectively, we are part of an administration that really does get that and really understands it. And we will work together to reach a point where we can really, in 2018, find some new meaning in that. So again, I thank you so much for sharing that story. Um, Council Member Carlos, I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit about a few things that, that the administration has done. So I'd like to begin with paid safe, which uh, was passed in 2017. And paid safe is really um, an, um, an expansion of the Paid Sick Leave Act, which allows survivors of intimate partner violence, of stalking, trafficking, um, and, uh, and sexual assault to be able to use their accrued sick time for some of the issues that you just mentioned, to be able to take time off from work, to go to a, a, a legal appointment, to go see an advocate, to maybe negotiate changing schools for, for because they need to move. So we are thinking about those kinds of efforts. Around the issue of stalking, um, we, we have a, 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 a very robust program that we're working with the police department on that's called the Coordinated Approach to Prevent Stalking. And what we do there is we work in, in partnership with the police department district attorney's office to really do extensive training on how we can improve their reporting on stalking. If we can include stalking as part of the charges, it elevates it. And so we're doing that as well. And we've rolled that out in multiple boroughs. We've, we began in Staten Island. We then went to Queens. And now we're in the Bronx. Um, so that what we're doing there is really in conjunction with NYPD and the district attorney's office to better respond to survivors when they are experiencing that. We are also, we are also doing a major piece on economic development. And, and the DAs are actually prosecuting yes. and doing and more yes, than a, a ACD and temporary order of protection yes. for more than two years and people are actually seeing uh, 
being forced into a rehabilitation program because that's not happening in Manhattan at all. What we're doing in those boroughs is really looking at how together we can put together a response that, that really focuses on what the needs of the survivors are at that point, as well as bringing better responses from the systems that you just named in, in terms of a resolution. I'm going to ask uh, com Council Member Combo has a question, and then as I said, Helen, this, some is, this is actually experts. happening to constituents, it's happening to me. I just want to hear. Beyond the order of protection, are we actually taking steps and to get the people into the, the the perpetrators to stop? And if they need rehabilitation, getting whatever, getting the court to actually order these people to get the help they need to leave people alone, so that they can move on with their lives. As my colleague was saying, that this isn't mm -hmm. about anything other than power, and we need to educate them so that they can change that relationship. So through our program, we, we are getting enhanced arrests. We're also getting, we're also improving the programs that offenders are being referred to within the criminal justice system. We are also exploring ways of um, having community responses that are not criminal justice based so that we can get some change in behavior so that they can leave the survivor alone. So we are exploring that whole continuum of services that are rooted in criminal justice responses and, and also rooted in community responses. I'd like your help. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Councilmember Kalos. Councilmember Kumba. Thank you, Chair Rosenthal. And I too want to applaud or to thank Councilmember Ayala for her bravery and her courage of speaking her truth. Um, I know that so often our personal issues, we feel as council members, sometimes we have to mask all of the things that we're dealing with personally because we want to appear to be stronger than humanly possible. But I really thank you because you sharing that shows that you're really just that much stronger for being able to have the courage to share that. Um, and as Councilmember Kahlo said, hopefully more people will see and find their courage and their voice um, through you sharing your experience. I wanted to ask, I had a town hall meeting last night and this question comes up quite often, uh, Commissioner Noel, and I'm so happy to have you here, around housing and housing being such a critical aspect um, in terms of people being able, able to have as Councilmember Ayala illustrated, that freedom. And so can you talk about any movement or discussion or how is the housing lotteries interfacing with um, individuals who are um, experiencing domestic violence? Have we figured out ways to have a preference in our housing lotteries as well as with NYCHA? And how does that actually work? Because we know that housing is pretty much the most critical aspect for people being able to uh, leave an abuser because as many people say, you know, when they hear about domestic violence, their first question is, why don't they just leave? And in a city like New York, that's probably the most complicated question about why someone just can't leave. Well, I'd like to begin, as everyone knows that housing is just a very scarce resource in New York City. And it is a challenge. It clearly is a challenge, not only for domestic violence survivors, but I say for everyone in the city to find safe and affordable housing. Um, it's further complicated in the case of domestic violence survivors. I'd first like to say that, um, that we have been working with HPD around the whole issue of being able to sever leases, being able to screen appropriately for domestic violence survivors when the issue when they are in uh, subsidized housing and the issue presents itself. So we've been doing extensive training with HPD, working with them on the improvement of those forms, working with them on how they assess and what they can do within that context to be able to have hearings around, around um, both severing this lease for the survivors and then determining um, where the apartment goes. Clearly, NYCHA has had a process in place for a long time around domestic violence survivors and being able to access housing, 
access NYCHA housing using the domestic violence um, preference, and that's still in place, and it has, it has been informed and updated consistent with VAWA regulations and procedures. And then we also have, as part of the Domestic Violence Task Force, um, a, a whole subcommittee that's really looking at the issue of housing across the city for domestic violence survivors and how we can improve either the, the entry points to reflect right the needs of survivors, how we can streamline some of those processes, which sometimes are very lengthy. And, and so that's what the subcommittee is doing at this point, and we hope to move those recommendations forward. Have we still, um, as it pertains to the lotteries, is there still a push or a move to make those um, that are the victims of domestic violence a preference? Um, under under uh, NYCHA, there, there is a process that establishes you as a survivor and, and then um, gives you access through that route over and above other, other avenues right. of access into that, and that still exists. But not in terms of the affordable housing lotteries throughout the city? Um, I would have to check on that and get back to you. On okay, that. thank you. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Um, to all of you for the work that you do every day. Um, we really uh, appreciate your public service. So thank you for your time. Look forward to following up with you on the oversight work and on all of these uh, pieces of legislation. Thank you. All right, um, thank you for testifying. I'm gonna call up the next panel, um, which is a group of experts and community organizations um, Melissa Paquette from Safe Horizon, um, Julie Gold, uh, sorry, I can't read your handwriting, Goldseed, uh, who I'm told is the expert to listen to from CUNY Law School, um, Namasha Schelling from Day One, and Amanda Hayden from the LGBT Community Center. Um, and I think uh, for the, I think someone needs to leave. If if the person who need to, needs to leave goes first, that's fine by me. And um, uh, don't be offended. Hang on, I'm going to do some quick mental math. We have an hour and a half, which is 90 minutes. And five. You know, uh, unfortunately, we're going to start at a two-minute clock, and just we have your testimony. Just let us know the most salient points that you think the public needs to hear. Um, trust me, all of us will be reading your testimony. Um, okay, so if you could introduce yourself. I think we're starting with Ms. Schelling, or no. Starting with you. <laughs> Great. Hi, uh, my name is Julie Goldscheid. Oh, thank you. I'm uh, on the faculty at CUNY Law School, I, uh, which, as you probably know, is the only public law school in New York City, one of the most diverse law schools in the country. Um, for over 30 years, I've advocated on behalf of survivors of gender violence, including intimate partner and sexual violence. Before I joined the faculty at CUNY, I was general counsel at Safe Horizon, which I believe is here today. Um, and I was a staff, senior staff attorney and acting legal director at the organization formerly known as Now Legal Defense Fund. It's now called Legal Momentum. Um, I won't say anything more about what I did there. But um, I welcome the opportunity to speak with the council and I commend the council's efforts to address this really important issue and I particularly appreciate council members Ayala, council member Ayala's testimony this morning. Um, your bravery is a reminder to all of us of the importance of this work. So I'll say really quickly um, a few words about intro 351, uh, intro 542, and intro 1085. And I think my, um, the theme of my testimony is really about coordination and um, conversation with the advocates and the providers on the ground to figure out how best to reach the laudable goals of each of those pieces of legislation. I think some of the questions that were raised this morning go to what perhaps might be solutions to meet those goals. And I'll highlight maybe a few um, quick points. 
Um, on intro 351, I think the idea of um, not duplicating efforts and identifying goals and shared goals and how to meet those goals without imposing additional burdens. Um, I have specific questions about some of the requirements that are in my testimony and I'd be happy to um, answer any follow-up questions about why I raised them, but in the interest of time, I won't focus on those now. Um, for intro 542, um, similarly, I think some important questions were raised earlier. My questions are about client input, um, language access, and what mechanisms are incorporated for regularizing feedback. We all, we all have participated in many surveys. That's great. I have confidence that that feedback is taken seriously here, but um, I think if there's a bill like this, the best interests are served by um, developing mechanisms to incorporate that as a regular practice going forward. Um, with respect to intro 1085, civil legal assistance is really important. I think you know that um, civil legal assistance has been found to be one of the most important factors contributing to reducing um, recidivism, the incidence of abuse. I have some citations in my testimony if you don't already have those sources. I think the question of counsel for divorce proceedings is a really important one and a really complex one. So the providers who are here can testify in greater detail about um, about the nature of divorce representation, which is complex. I have questions about um, the needs that have, whether any uh, needs assessment has been done, what data has driven the, um, the proposal. And I would just encourage um, collaboration with the service providers so that any efforts are directed toward the um, folks who have the greatest need and um, so that there's coordination of, um, of provision of services with trained legal services providers. And I guess the, um, the only other things I will um, emphasize before I close is just the importance of funding that would extend over the length of a divorce proceeding, which can be lengthy, and that whatever funding is provided um, funds training and supervision because um, representation in divorce proceedings is a very specialized area of expertise, and whoever providers are need to both be trained but also have infrastructure sufficient to ensure that quality legal services are provided, which I know is the aim of the council. Thank you. Hello, my name is Namasha Schelling. I'm the communications manager at day one. I'm going to try to be as brief as possible. Uh, day One is the only New York organization committing its full resources to address dating violence among youth 24 years of age and younger through a combination of services that include prevention, social services, legal, legal advocacy, and leadership development. We work to create a world without dating violence. We appreciate the opportunity to share our experiences and perspective on the legislation pending before the council. Um, with this in mind, we offer the following testimony focused on the unique experiences of young survivors. Regarding intro 371, relating to the trainings to help cosmetologists recognize signs of domestic violence in their clients, at day one we welcome opportunities to partner and share knowledge with professionals from different sectors to learn about the signs of domestic violence. We also believe that everyone can play a role in ending dating violence from friends, colleagues, and trusted professionals, including cosmetologists. In fact, day one has partnered over the years with the Cornell Workers Institute to train cosmetology students. Through our years of experience in trainings, we, we've learned that training professionals must be accompanied by follow-up by follow reinforcement of practices and spaces to explore challenging questions. Um, we believe that a victim, sorry, we believe that a victim connecting with a trained cosmetologist can create an important access, access point for that victim. It also is no substitute for connecting with a professional who has deeper knowledge about the issue of domestic violence. We're concerned about, one, the lack of potential confidentiality two, safety concerns that may arise for victims and cosmetologists themselves, and three, tailoring trainings and follow-up resources so that they are responsive to what these professionals are seeing in their field. Um, regarding intro 542, in relation to requiring the office to combat domestic and gender-based violence to provide clients with service satisfaction surveys, we believe satisfaction surveys can be important tools to assess clients' needs and to provide feedback on the services provided. We believe they could be used to identify emerging issues, track progress, and have the opportunity to remedy or correct issues through each reporting period. Simultaneously, we would want to ensure that a survey of F FJCs would not replace more accurate surveys of youth that could be done by the Department of Health, Education, 
or the Department of Youth and Community Development. At day one, we recognize that many young people may not reach out, um, sorry, may not reach out to a family justice center for a variety of reasons, such as fear that reporting can lead to the un unintended involvement of law enforcement through ICE or police um, for themselves or their loved ones or possibly burdensome scrutiny from the ACS. With this in mind, we believe that satisfaction surveys can be critical tools, but should not be used to assess the experiences of survivors in New York City as a whole. Thank you. Can I ask you to wrap it up? We really have your testimony. Okay. It's, it'll go right in the file. I'm going to read it. General Counsel's going to read it. Policies. It's going to shape the next version of our legislation. Okay, then I'll I'll stop then. Thank okay. you. Okay. I mean, just as a reminder, everyone, we just want to be able to get to everyone in the audience. I apologize. No worries. Thank you. So, thank you, Councilmember Rosenthal, for convening this, and thank you, Councilmember Ayala, for sharing your story. It's a story that a lot of our clients at Safe Horizon also share with you. My name is Melissa Paquette. I'm the director of Safe Horizon's Domestic Violence Law Project. We provide free legal services to low income victims of domestic violence throughout the city. Um, in the areas of family law and matrimonial law. I'd like to first address intro 1085 and thank Councilmember Traeger for recognizing that victims of domestic violence are in need of expanded legal services. The divorce process in our state can be complex and daunting, especially for those who are adverse in the court process to their abusive spouse. At our law project, we intake victims at varying stages in the legal process. Some of our clients are still living with their abusive spouse. Some of them are in year three of their divorce litigation, and some have had no contact with their spouse in decades. Our clients report various victimizations, including physical abuse, economic abuse, emotional abuse. In considering how legal services can be most impactful for victims, we encourage the City Council to consider the following questions. How do you define a victim of domestic violence? when in the legal process would assignment of a lawyer be most impactful? Should there be an income cap so to ensure victims most in financial need receive legal services? Will lawyers assigned to victims have training in domestic violence? We recommend that the city conduct research and data collection to answer these questions and to ensure that these legal services are responsive to the needs of victims. With regard to intro 0542 and intro 0351, our primary concern is that clients are the focus of the family justice centers. So we don't want any surveys or data collection to take away time from client services that they have come to the center to receive. We also are concerned about confidentiality and accessibility in the survey results. So making sure the surveys are in multiple languages, written simply, and protecting confidential conversations. Thank you again. Hello, good morning. Hi, good morning. Um, my name is Amanda Hayden and I am the Families Program Coordinator at the Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, and Transgender Community Center, commonly referred to as the Center. Um, we formed the Center in 1983 in response to the AIDS epidemic, ensuring a place for LGBTQ people to access information, care, and support they were not receiving elsewhere. Um, and we are now the lar second largest LGBT community in the country and the first largest on the East Coast, serving New Yorkers across all five boroughs. Um, I've personally been at the center since 2016, working in two different roles. As a family permanency coordinator, I oversaw our family acceptance work and trained dozens of mental health and social service practitioners on LGBTQ affirming family support. In my current role, I oversee all of our programming on family building and relationship support. And we s frequently see individuals seeking mental health support around relationships, whereas there is a presence of active or historic domestic violence. Um, I do want to take a moment to thank the Anti-Violence Project for their ongoing support related to our work in this area. And as a member of the LGBTQ community, I have personally supported multiple queer and trans friends through emotionally and physically abusive relationships. I can say firsthand that affirming information and services for LGBTQ survivors are limited, resources are strained, and we need support. Um, we commend Mayor de Blasio for his recent executive order to expand the mayor's office to combat domestic violence. With the expansion, many types of intimate partner violence frequently experienced by my community are given increased awareness. Um, so research consistently demonstrates that LGBTQ people experience similar or higher rates of intimate partner violence compared to cisgender and heterosexual counterparts. 
In addition, during the past two years, we have witnessed a rise in hate crimes nationwide, and the most recent FBI data includes indicates that LGBTQ individuals comprise the second most targeted group. Furthermore, LGBTQ individuals have historically faced higher stigma about their relationships compared to cisgender and heterosexual individuals. Compounding this societal stigma is the fact that many law enforcement agencies and staffs are not affirming of the spectrum of identities, creating a deterrent to report any violence. Um, so we, um, we support further data collection, consistent data collection, and um, collecting data around sexual orientation and gender identity across the city. Thank you so much, uh, really appreciate it. Um, and thank you all for your testimony. Uh, Professor, I, if it's all right with you, I'd like to follow up and have an in-person meeting to discuss the issues that you've worked of on. Of okay, course. thank you very much. I'm gonna call up the next panel. Um, hang on, do we have, that's all right. Um, uh, who are our legal experts, and I just want to note, um, hang on one second, uh, Judith Goldner and Celia Irvine from Legal Aid Society, Terry Lawson from Legal Services and Bronx Legal Services, and Mark uh, Mager, I hope I'm saying that right, from New York Legal Assistance Group. Um, and I, I just want to mention that um, we do have several representatives from uh, the organization Voices of Women. We're going to hold on to that testimony till the end to just sort of drive home the point uh, of everything we're talking about today. So, so I want to th thank you and know that you are much appreciated. Uh, if you could begin, starting with you, just announce uh, yourself, uh, give copies of the testimony to the sergeant, and again, we're on a two-minute clock. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to testify. Uh, my name is Terry Lawson. I'm the director of the Family and Immigration Unit at Bronx Legal Services, which is an office of Legal Services NYC. Um, Legal Services has been in the Family Justice Centers run by NGBV GBV, um, since their inception, and last year we provided civil legal services in over 2,000 family, matrimonial, immigration, and housing cases for FJC clients. Um, we... Sorry. <laughs> We are very grateful for the Family Justice Centers and the incredible work of NGBV. Before the FJCs came into place, we struggled to connect our clients to other service providers, to the police, to district attorney's offices. And these days, we rely heavily on the counseling and case management services that are available at the FJCs. Their willingness, the NGBV's willingness to work with us to find the best solutions has made, made our work together more meaningful. With respect to intro 1085, I want to thank Councilmember Traeger and Councilmember Ayala um, for this bill and also thank Councilmember Ayala for speaking her, her truth. Um, as people have testified already, survivors would benefit significantly uh, from this bill. I wanted to also draw, uh, reiterate what was said about these including um, representation for post-judgment contempt proceedings uh, and that it should be available for homeowners or for those who on paper have assets but are unable to access those assets due to financial abuse. I want to thank Councilmember Salamanca for his bill um, to make trainings available to cosmetologists and for working to reduce toxic masculinity in our communities by getting everybody on the same page on these issues. Um, and with respect to the data collection, I just want to ask the City Council to tread very carefully in imposing more administrative burdens on providers uh, because it is the providers that are meeting with the clients and not NGBV. So, and many of us are at the FJCs providing the services without funding from MockJ. Uh, so we ask that the Council tread very carefully before imposing additional burdens on already, already overtaxed providers. Thank you. Thank you, I appreciate that. Sorry, thank you. Good morning, uh, and thank you for the opportunity to be here, and happy birthday. Uh, my name is Mark Hager. I'm a supervising attorney at NYLEG's uh, Matrimonial and Family Law Department. I'm going to speak briefly about the divorce bill. Um, we're currently doing this type of work, uh, and we recognize that there are large gaps in providing um, both 
low income and working poor, survivors of domestic violence with representation in, in divorce proceedings, which, uh, as has been said, can take many years of litigation. Um, also, I think it's important to note that when we're working with working poor and low income, we can be talking about pensions. Uh, my organization has litigated cases where both uh, the survivor and the perpetrator of violence were on a lease for a NYCHA apartment, and when homelessness becomes an issue in a divorce, you have almost no choice but to litigate the action to its completion. Um, and we would welcome the opportunity to speak with the council further about the complexities of divorce actions that can often take years to resolve. Uh, there's significant uh, complexity within the uh, Supreme Court system in order to file and obtain a divorce successfully. Uh, it's very challenging for pro se litigants to do that. Um, in addition, it's also very difficult for survivors to have to go through that process on their own, sometimes with the burden of negotiating or litigating a settlement with someone who previously exhibited and, and most likely still has some amount of control and power over the other litigant. So it's very challenging, and we'd, uh, we'd ask for the opportunity to speak with the council about those issues. Um, I don't want to repeat uh, what has been said already, but we would also have, would want answers to questions about how this, uh, how the terms are being defined in terms of domestic violence, who would be eligible, um, and to make sure that the providers who would be assigned and represent clients in these cases would be trained to specifically uh, address the issues that are reoccurring within uh, domestic violence relationships but are very nuanced. Thank you. Hi, good, good morning and thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Celia Irvin. I am a staff attorney at the Legal Aid Society. Judith Goldner had to leave earlier. I'm, I'm going to speak of, with respect to intro 1085. I am a staff attorney in the Manhattan, in Manhattan in, for the Legal Aid Society. My entire practice consists of contested matrimonials. I am one person. I represent people who are in all the stages of fleeing domestic violence. Some have fled, some are still living with their abusers, some, and some are plaintiffs, and some are defendants. There's a huge need for services. We are forced to turn many people away every single day. Um, there's clearly a need for expanded legal representation in matrimonial litigation. I would encourage the council as you continue to explore these issues to look towards the not-for-profit providers with proven track records of both representing victims of domestic violence in a trauma-informed and holistic manner and representing survivors in the more complicated as well as the simple matrimonial matters. I think we often, outside of matrimonial lawyers, refer to contested divorces as divorces where people are in dispute about being divorced, but a contested divorce is a litigated divorce, and it can involve a range of issues involving children and financial issues. I would also encourage the council and the committee to um, look to a holistic and not a narrow definition of survivor of domestic violence as for many reasons which you are well aware of, victims do not always seek um, orders of protection. And thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate uh, your work that all of you do every day. It's real public service. Appreciate you. I'm going to call up the next panel. Um, do we have the, oh, sorry. Um, now from the assault, violence, and justice-focused community groups, we have um, Mary Haviland, if she's still here. Um, oh, hi, Mary. Uh, from the New York Alliance Against Sexual Assault, we have um, Ms. Ray from the New York City Anti-Violence Project, thank you. Uh, Aisha Bailey from Fortune Society and Amy Barash from Her Justice. Thank you so much. Sorry.
Thank you. You may begin. Uh, my name is Audacia Ray, and I am the Director of Community Organizing and Public Advocacy at the New York City Anti-Violence Project. We provide um, services and support to LGBTQ survivors of many different kinds of violence. Um, and I'm going to um, focus on um, intro 371A and intro 1085. Uh, just very briefly on um, 371A. Um, I want to boost what Councilmember Salamanca said. I really appreciate you also identifying that those spaces, that um, barbershops and salons can be a space where we can identify people who might cause harm. Um, and I think that's a really um, important piece of that um, because really if we're going to be training people to recognize signs of intimate partner violence, it can't just be about survivors. It also has to be about people who are potentially doing harm. And also, we need to complicate how we talk about gender in these contexts, that um, abuse and survival are not binary identities, um, and they're not necessarily in alignment with um, you know, the, the person doing harm being masculine identified and the um, person being abused um, being feminine identified. So um, that's something that, that EVP is always bringing up in these spaces and be really important to discuss um, as, as that bill moves forward. Um, and I also want to spend a little bit more time um, complicating the narrative um, around intro 1085. Um, so really the commonly held view is that the abusive partner is the one who's employed and controls all of the money so that the survivor is dependent on them. Um, I'm a survivor of intimate partner violence and that was not the situation I was in. Um, the, this bill would not have helped me because um, I work. I was working, and my abuser was not. He was spending my money and putting me into credit card debt and exerting power and control over our finances. Um, he told me regularly that um, without me, he'd be homeless and he'd probably kill himself, and that coerced me into staying for a while. Um, I had family and community support, um, so when I was finally able to leave and get an order of protection, um, I would not have needed assistance for my own divorce expenses, but because he was refusing to work or couldn't find work, um, he didn't have the resources to, to pay for his expenses, so it kept me trapped in that marriage. Um, and, and so I know it's kind of counterintuitive to say that we should um, be paying for the divorce expenses of people who's ca who've caused harm, um, and we can you know sort of hash that out a little bit more, but um, because of the way power and control exists in those relationships, it can really um, continue to trap survivors in marriages that um, they need to be out of. Um, okay, I'm going to wrap it up. Thanks so much. Hi, good morning. Um, my name is Alicia Bailey. The red button? Okay, thank you. Good morning. My name is Alicia Bailey. I'm an alternative to incarceration counselor with Fortune Society. Um, I'm he here testifying today on behalf of the Fortune Society, and I'd like to thank everybody, the members of the council, for being here and listening to our testify. Um, I'll start out with what I wrote in regards to some statistics and stuff. Uh, one in four women and one in seven men will experience severe physical violence and inter intimate partner in their lifetime. Domestic violence and the resulting trauma can significantly impact a person's mental health. Experience and abuse influence how a person feels, thinks, and connects with the world. Um, for some survivors, the traumatic effects of abuse can be alleviated with increased safety and support, while others require more comprehensive treatment care. Um, for me, the help was available at the just <coughs> sorry at the Family Justice Center. Um, the psychological, verbal, and emotional abuse for me had lasted five long years. Therefore, when the only sentiments expressed are negative or derogatory and purposely damage to your psychological well-being, it can be hurtful. Um, if nothing more, sorry, when I heard, unfortunately, nearly half of all the men and women in the United States will experience psychological aggression by an intimate partner. Um, what resonated for me to make changes is when I heard my teenage daughter mimic the learned relationship dynamic in her young dating life and like a freight train that hit me that this had to stop. 
Um, recently, I organized the Purple Ribbon Campaign for the Domestic Violence Awareness Month at Fortune Society and designated a day for the agency to wear purple. I'm eager um, to continue sharing my experience and expertise as a survivor and weigh in on the proposed reforms like the ones before the committee today. I wholeheartedly support intro number 1085. Um, in many African American and Hispanic communities, people fear the legal system and therefore will not report abuse or let alone seek divorce. And intro number 542 is also an important step in the right direction, helping survivors increase access to economic resources and physical safety and legal protection. Regarding intro number 351, I believe this report will help the mayor, the speaker, and the public understand certain domestic violence initiatives of the city leading to greater transparency. Um, Fortune Society just wanted to applaud the New York City Committee on Women for recognizing the complexities that being a survivor of domestic violence present, and we urge you to explore further the intersection of incarceration and domestic violence. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Um, my name is Amy Barish. I'm the executive director of Her Justice, a nonprofit organization that stands with women living in poverty in New York City. We serve them with a pro bono first approach to providing free legal assistance. We train, mentor, and support volunteer attorneys to address the individual and systemic legal needs that they face. Our pro bono model enables our 18-person legal department to help over 3,000 women and their 4,000 children in family divorce and immigration matters every year. Our clients are the working poor with very limited resources. They live in all five boroughs of the city. Over half are Latina, almost a third need interpreters in court, 80% are victims of domestic violence, and most are mothers who are or become the heads of their households. Her Justice recognizes the severe shortage of lawyers available for low-income New Yorkers in our areas of practice and are very grateful to the council member and the council for discussing divorce in particular. In the family and supreme matrimonial parts, that burden of lack of representation falls with disproportionate weight on women who make up the bulk of the unrepresented in these matters. These areas represent two-thirds of our practice, and we have handled as many as 200 divorce clients a year. Many of the issues, um, the questions that we would raise with regard to intro 1085 have been raised by my colleagues today. I just want to emphasize, as I mentioned, the particular harm that come to low-income women generally when they're facing divorce and seeking representation, um, the distinction between uncontested and contested divorces, and some of the implementation questions that would need to be addressed with the proposal. Um, as we understand it, the proposed bill would address both uncontested and contested divorces. And as was mentioned earlier, although uncontested divorces are designed to be pro se proceedings, the reality is that over 30 forms must be submitted in these cases. And at times, the court does exercise its discretion to actually calendar these cases if they're not um, convinced that an underlying issue has been appropriately resolved. So we absolutely agree that assistance is needed in these situations. It may, however, be that careful review of the process of the forms, which have not been looked at in a long time, might enable many of those cases to move forward in a ministerial way without representation. We would look forward to discussing the overhaul of that process together. We also did want to raise the question as to whether counsel, if we're considering counsel, the provision of counsel in divorce matters, whether we might want to look beyond exclusively the victim in partner violence. As my colleague mentioned, most proceedings move forward better when both parties are represented. Um, and although that may be counterintuitive, a faster, more just proceeding benefits everyone, most especially the victim of abuse. That is also tied into the fact that it's very difficult sometimes to identify the actual victim. Abusers often portray themselves as victims may have gone as far as filing for orders of protection if uh, representation were provided in cases to both parties when abuse has been alleged, then we would avoid that problem. We also, because we represent all women living in poverty, 80% of whom are victims of partner violence, encourage the council to really think more broadly about the representation of making representation available to low-income people generally. There is representation currently available for the matters in divorce that would have been, um, for which you would have had representation in family court, so in other words, custody and orders for protection, but not for the financial elements of divorce. So if we expanded representation to those elements, then there would be that right to counsel. And as my colleague said, oftentimes the economic uh, challenges, both the money and the debt, are what really impoverishes somebody post-divorce. 
And then um, finally, just some of the, uh, the questions about who qualifies for, who would qualify for this um, benefit, as well as at what point during the proceeding and how would that determination be made are some of the questions I think that we would need to grapple with. But again, we really appreciate the council members addressing the issue of divorce representation for low-income people in New York City. Thank you. Good morning. Um, my name is Mary Haviland. I'm the executive director of the New York City Alliance Against Sexual Assault. I'm going to take a little bit of a different tact. I'm going to address the issues that I see coming up around the expansion of the role of the office, to, the previous office to combat domestic violence, now the office to end domestic and gender-based violence. Um, and I'm going to skip ahead in my testimony just to make some uh, so, uh, sort of observations. I do want to praise the office for the work they have historically done that has raised the, the, um, the issue of domestic violence. Um, it, their leadership has led to policy improvements and access to city services for domestic violence that have been crucial, um, including the uh, family justice centers um, and to their credit, the evaluation of the family justice centers. But I do want to recognize the 16 rape crisis programs in New York City. Um, they, they are um, a host of experts in this area. They've developed sophisticated understanding and the care required in the health sector, the clinical needs of survivors when healing from sexual violence, the systemic issues that face survivors who seek justice, and generally the obstacles facing survivors with institutional responses to the issue. Um, as a result, I would really like to um, uh, encourage the council to think about uh, legislation that would um, in, um, empower these, uh, these uh, stakeholders and services in the community to um, have information about the office and also um, to be participating in their, um, in their work in a daily way. Um, and uh, so I, in my testimony, and you can read it, um, I suggest that um, a couple of things, uh, that the office collaborate and meet regularly with these um, service providers, um, that they actively engage in the direction of additional resources dedicated to this issue to community sexual violence programs, and that the council consider mandating an annual report that would report out on, I have six different things listed here, and I'm not going to go through them, but report out on the uh, office's work so that people in the community cannot um, duplicate the work they're doing and also know about the work they're doing. Um, and I thank you very much uh, for, my, uh, for the time today. This is like a powerhouse panel. The whole room is powerhouse. And uh, I just want to thank you for your public service. Thank you for sharing your stories. Uh, we have your testimony. It'll help flesh out the legislation that we have proposed. So thank you very much for coming today. The next panel uh, is, uh, let me call up Mary Luke from United Nations. Dorsheen Liedholt from Sanctuary for Families, and Gianna Alvarez from Black Women's Blueprint. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you very much, Chairwoman Rosenthal, and for the bills of uh, Councilman um, Traeger, and Lanceman, and thank you very much, uh, Councilwoman Ayala, for your courageous testimony and sharing your story. Um, I'm the president of the Metro New York chapter of UN Women, and also the co-chair of the steering committee of the New York City for CEDAW Act. And so I'm really speaking to you on behalf of both those organizations that obviously have violence against women as a primary focus. Um, it's, uh, it's really wonderful to hear the compassion and the commitment of both men and women in this area. And today I really want to speak to the issue of language access. Um, I think that under the strong leadership of Commissioner Noel, we have 
fantastic uh, family justice centers that are available and that have a network of community-based NGOs. We have services like uh, the Multilingual Domestic Violence Hotline, as well as Language Line Dual Handset Phones. Um, but there could be a lot more. So it's really important to recognize the importance of language access to domestic violence survivors. When I was a hotline counselor at Womankind, I talked to many survivors who spoke no English. We were fortunate to have counselors in 18 different Asian languages, and they had, 14, they had 1,600 first-time callers on their hotline. And so it's so important that victims are able to tell their stories in their own language, particularly when filing police reports or petitions for orders of, of protection. Uh, these services can be so complicated and so personal, obviously. So let me just speak a little bit to the issues of intro 351. I recommend that um, I'm in favor of all these um, uh, bills, but I recommend modification of 351 to include that the numbers of attorneys placed and working in FHACs by language, gender, st um, and ethnicity be reported. In the service uh, uh, satisfaction surveys, they need to be in multiple languages, not um, uh, given by staff but by independent uh, persons and that low literacy clients have the opportunity to, uh, to answer specifically. And in intro 1085, um, we also recommend that uh, uh, attorneys who are assigned uh, have access to multiple languages uh, uh, with interpreters so that uh, the clients can be prepared um, and be able to be properly represented in court appearances. Thank you very much. Good morning. My name is Dorchen Leitholt, and I'm the director of the Center for Battered Women's Legal Services at Sanctuary for Families, New York State's largest provider of dedicated comprehensive services for victims of domestic violence, human trafficking, and related forms of gender-based violence. Um, because of the limited time, I'm going to focus on only one of the bills before this committee, Intro 1085, um, which recognizes the urgent need for free, high-quality legal representation in matrimonial cases for survivors of domestic violence unable to afford attorneys. Intimate partner abusers are all too frequently all too frequently include complex economic abuse as part of the toxic mix of physical, emotional, sexual, and other damaging forms of coercive control. In addition to the emotional trauma of remaining legally chained to an individual who threatened you, hurt you, and made you fear for your life and the safety of your children, the economic consequences of being trapped in marriages to an abusive spouse are often severe. Marriage to an abusive partner puts survivor's future income and savings in jeopardy, leaves the door open to the abuser making critical medical decisions on the victim's behalf, as has been pointed out, and racking up debt in the victim's name that may detrimentally affect her ability to rent an apartment or access credit. Trapped in an abusive marriage, victims cannot remarry or have other children without their abusive spouse being considered the other parent in the eyes of our current state law. All of this makes severing marital ties critically important for married abuse survivors. As Council Member Ayala made clear, divorce has profound implications for an abuse survivor's long-term safety, freedom, and economic security. Family courts in our state are designed for pro se litigants, offering the availability of court-appointed attorneys for child custody and visitation, child welfare, and protective order cases. In the Supreme Court where matrimonial actions are litigated, however, court-appointed counsel are unavailable in some of the most important issues, divisions of marital property, child support, and maintenance. Lay people, especially those struggling with the traumatic sequelae of abuse, are ill-equipped to represent themselves in these complex matters. Domestic violence is almost invariably premised on an acute imbalance of power. 
Divorce exacerbates this economic imbalance by forcing victims to go into debt to pay attorneys who often charge legal fees of $500 an hour or more. After exhausting their savings and taking on more and more debt, victims frequently find that they are unable to continue to pay legal fees. Many private matrimonial law lawyers have no compunction about terminating representation once their clients have run out of funds. Sanctuary recently took over the representation of a case in the Integrated Domestic Violence Court in which a mother struggling to provide a middle-class existence for herself and her daughter in a two-year period spent her life savings and wrapped up, racked up $200,000 in debt, paying for matrimonial lawyers who were ill-equipped to address the long history of domestic violence and left her without the protection from abuse that she and her daughter desperately needed. Broke and indebted, with her credit damaged beyond repair, she found herself once again slipping under her abuser's economic and physical control as she stood in court unrepresented while her abuser stood beside his well-remunerated counsel. The scales of justice tip precariously and due process becomes an illusion when an abusive partner appears in court with an attorney and the victim appears pro se, as is too often the case. Without a highly skilled advocate to inform them of and fight for their rights, and faced with the possibility of years of litigation and terrifying unknowns, victims are likely to agree to unfavorable terms just to put their case behind them. Um, this, Ms. Yes. Leto, thank you so much. And hey, we have the words. Thank of you. Your and if, if I just may give in a the final. Last, yep, yes. absolutely. And um, in your last just, um, paragraph. Well, you make some comments about how to fix the yes. bill. Well, if you could wrap up if, we'll do. just with the biggest highlight yes. that pops well, out at you. So simply to say, intro 1085 is a commendable start to addressing these concerns, but specific language is needed to ensure that it is applied as intended, and we really look forward to partnering with the council member sponsors in, um, in um, improving on this important bill and in, um, in advocating for it. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much. Yep. If you could introduce yourself. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Joanna Alvarez, and I'm from Black Women's Blueprint. Thank you for the invitation to give testimony on the issue of domestic violence here in New York City communities. Um, Black Women's Blueprints work to place black women and girls' lives struggle squarely within the context of larger racial justice concerns and is committed to building movements where gender matters and social justice organizing so that all members of black communities achieve social, political, economic equality. We are in favor of the proposed bill to support survivors with legal services as well as training for cosmetologists in the issue of domestic violence. Our experience at Black Women's Blueprint reveals that the number of sexual assault and domestic violences and those that go unreported are considerably higher in our African American communities. Silence prevails and the invisibility is almost complete within our black communities and in greater society about black women's lives, about the level of victimization, the systematic exclusion of our specific gender experiences, and the broader agenda for civil and human rights. According to the National Intimate Partner Violence Survey, one in five women have been raped at some time in their lives. Black women experience rate at 22% higher than white women. There are several reasons for the disparity in breaking silences about sexual assault and domestic violence, and especially rape. First, the marginalization of African Americans as a population due to the effects of racism, socioeconomic, and historical factors. Second, our experience working with black populations in New York City revealed that victims do not avail themselves of services, as it's not congruent with African American cultural norms on their community to explore, to expose intercommunity, interfamilial issues that places already marginalized communities at further risk for discrimination and harm. Codes of loyalty and protection of community, which have historically existed and especially been taught to black women and girls who represent the bulk of sexual assault and domestic violence communities and communities. Can also discourage black women from seeking help based on ideology that reporting a sexual assault and domestic violence will further vilify a black man or betray the community and place already marginalized communities at further risk for discrimination and harm. The project of truth telling and testimony cannot end here. 
it had to continue as there are thousands and maybe even millions of stories still to come forward. This is only the beginning of our work as truth bearers, holding the stories of black women close to our own spirits and the traumas that we ourselves hold. In this moment, we can call forth truth telling, honest recognition, painful confession, and the beginnings of reconciliation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks to all of you. Really appreciate it. Um, uh, if I could just ask, um, sorry, hang on. Uh, Ms. Alvarez, uh, do you have a copy of your testimony? And we can make Xerox copies here, or if you want to send it electronically. I just want to really make sure your testimony is in the record. Yes, I can send it electronically. I really appreciate that. Thank, Thank you. you for your time. Um, and you know, in many ways, we could have started the day here, but I'm going to leisurely end the day um, with voices and call up um, Charlena Powell, um, Elizabeth Cohen, um, Saba Jackson, and um, Nalene Simon, all from Voices of Women Organizing Project and um, we're not going to put a clock on. We have plenty. We have all the time in the world uh, for you. And really appreciate your staying to hear about what public servants are doing um, on behalf of survivors and hearing what they're doing. Um, I'd be really interested in hearing um, whatever you plan to say in your testimony, but also specifically your thoughts about what we talked about today, what the city talked about in terms of um, what they're doing and you know whether or not you think the resources we have are sufficient, if they're misdirected, if um, you know emphasis needs to be somewhere different. Thank you. Could you please begin and introduce yourself? Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Sabra. Jackson, uh, I am a survivor of domestic violence. Uh, I am a board of directors member of the Voices of Women Organizing Project. Uh, just to have a conversation like this with, in front of the city council, we thank you. <laughs> That's the first thing. Uh, all of those warriors who have shared their stories, thank you. With that being said, um, I'm going to speak very shortly uh, so that the rest of my sisters uh, who have survived uh, an, an ordinance of things um, can speak. So as I said, my name is uh, Sabra Jackson. I'm a survivor of domestic violence. Um, I'm here on behalf of survivors, not only just to tell our stories, but to also share our concerns. I stand as a proud member of the Voices of Women Organizing Project, a grassroots organization of survivors of domestic violence to organize to improve systems that abuse women that rely on safety and for justice. There are many systems whose response to survivors of domestic violence can stand to be improved, which we discussed today. However, we are here to discuss some additional clarity for the new initiatives and recommendations being put forth and overseen by the mayor's office of, to end domestic uh, violence and gender-based violence. Uh, once again, I'm going to say, in my experience in 2004, there was not even a discussion like this. Um, so to be able to sit in front of the city council and to be able to uh, voice my experience as a survivor, we thank you again. Um, it's important that we acknowledge the crucial role of the office, the mayor's office to end domestic violence and gender-based violence, plays a survivor's recovery, uh, plays in the survivor's recovery process. For many survivors of domestic violence and their children and their services provided by the mayor's office can be the difference between life and death. So I'm gonna say it again. For many survivors of domestic violence and their children, the services provided 
by the mayor's office to end domestic violence and gender-based violence can be the difference between life and death. So we would like to continue to engage in continued discussions with the new initiatives and the suggested recommendations being put in place and how they will impact survivors and their children. For survivors, that can be an unsafe place to be in. Systems can be changed, systems can change, must be done in 100% of input of survivors and their advocates. So I'm going to cut this short, and every survivor story is different. There is not a one-size-fits-all that um, is a solution to the complex problems. It is crucial for the mayor's office to end domestic violence and gender-based violence to continue to explore and encouraging survivors' involvement, listening to our needs and the re recommendations for change. And once again, we're going to say there is no exaggeration to a survivor's involvement in policy making and changes could, could be a matter of life and death for survivors. Thank you. Hello, hello. <laughs> um, thank you, um, committee council, for the opportunity to be here, and happy birthday to um, Ms. Rosenthal. It is to my birthday this month. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to thank you to Diana Ayala, Ayala um, for your testimony. Thank you. My name is Nadine. I, am a, I once was a victim of domestic violence, and now I'm a proud survivor of domestic violence and a member of the Voices of Women known as VAL. VAL is a grassroots organization of survivors of domestic violence who organize to improve the systems that abuse women rely on for safety and justice. It's, an, it's important that we provide critical services to victims in need of a safe, compassionate, and a swift manner. All to let victims know that they are not alone, and for many victims, this is life-saving knowledge. One of the key gaps in providing critical domestic violence services is the lack of encouragement to survivors to apply for employment opportunities that provide services to victims of domestic violence. We believe that agencies that receive funding for domestic violence services should implement a peer-delivered service model approach and begin by having on all the employment opportunities include language that encourage survivors of domestic violence to apply for open positions. Moreover, we believe that city council and the mayor's office to end domestic violence and gender-based violence should mandate that funding for domestic violence service delivery include this process. Hiring survivors helps other survivors establish connections with someone who shares a similar story, can decrease system navigation and frustration, promotes positivity, and can inspire hope, which many survivors have lost during an abusive relationship. This is just the beginning, and we encourage all on work in the domestic violence services field to begin to implement a peer-delivered services model approach. Thank you. Thank you. And we're taking notes up here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hello, I'd like to thank everyone for making this possible and bringing in, uh, much needed help and attention to this area. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Cohen. I'm a member of VAL, and um, I'm also um, a victim of abuse. And um, I'm going to read my testimony. Um, legal representation for everyone, regardless of income, and especially for victims of abuse in Supreme Court and in post-matrimonial Supreme Court, is key to equal justice and protection of abused partners and their children. 
Abusers often use money to control their partner. When the partner leaves, they are at a tremendous disadvantage. The partner may have stopped working for pay to take care of their children and may face the challenge of reentering the workforce at minimum wage. Private matrimonial family lawyers earn hundreds of dollars an hour with no sliding scales. The cost of private legal representation can and does wipe out whatever money a partner has while they are trying to put a roof over their heads and food on the table in a safe place for themselves and their children. Many well-intentioned people tell the abused partner that there is free legal assistance available from organizations such as Legal Aid, NILAG, and Her Justice, as if resources to help were plentiful. But the reality is that when you actually need these resources and ask for help, you don't get it. The pool of people needing help far exceeds the available resources. The organizations appear to cope with the scarcity of resources by selecting flavors of the month and narrow casting them. But divorce from an abusive partner is not a simple narrow issue, and the net result is that help is not available for most people. Self-representation does not work. The system is not user-friendly. Putting a self-represented abused partner in court against an abuser with an experienced matrimonial lawyer is like taking an ordinary person and putting them in a ring with a prize fighter. You don't have to watch to know who will win. On the other hand, the abusive controlling partner has money. So excellent private legal representation is not a problem. In fact, the court system provides a legal way to abuse their ex-partners and children for the rest of their lives. There is no limit on how long a divorce can be litigated. One source said the record so far is 21 years. An abuser can take an abused partner back to court over and over again to impoverish them and prevent them from being able to find full-time employment because they are constantly being served with papers and called to court. Children provide another opportunity to attack the former partner because unlike the financial terms of a divorce settlement, Custody can always be changed. In an abusive situation, the children are often treated like furniture, to be divided or shared. Their feelings are not counted. Made powerless by the system, they lose their childhoods. I believe there is a connection between the fact that the largest group living in poverty in the city is single parents with children, and that one in five children in the city do not have enough to eat with the lack of legal representation in all divorce matters in court. There are many divorce cases before no-fault no divorce was passed that have not been identified as domestic violence because if a partner made abuse the grounds for the divorce and could not prove it, they were not granted a divorce and many victims were discouraged from labeling the abuse in court by their lawyers. Use of the court system to continue abusive attacks through excessive litigation for years and very lopsided and unfair settlements should be considered as indicators of abuse. Guaranteed legal representation, regardless of income, is essential to the preservation of our most important human rights. And I'd like to add, my own experience is that I am currently still engaged in legal um, uh, matters with my uh, former husband. And we have been, it's now 13 and a half years that I have been um, involved with the legal system. Um, and I now have approximately 35 banker's boxes full of legal papers in my home concerning my own matter. Um, and um, my ex-husband has um, done very well in the process. He is now remarried. Um, he has a country home on a lake. He has a large apartment, a car, and um, goes on vacations while my children and myself can, are very concerned about paying our rent and putting food on the table. I'd just like to give you that as well. And I'd like to make a point. I was listening carefully to some of the comments that were made, especially in the beginning, and people referred to um, having access to justice or access to legal, um, illegal counseling. There's a huge difference between access to counseling and advice which is a good first step, and actually having access to representation. It's very different. I have 
I was a former corporate librarian. I have, um, over the 13 and a half years, sought legal um, assistance from many different organizations, and I haven't gotten any. And um, I have gotten some legal advice on helplines recently, and I have visited the Family Justice Center, and I did get some advice, and it was wonderful they, they see the improvement in the way people are treated. But um, at, as at this point, I still have been unsuccessful in getting representation for myself, and um, I'm not looking forward to the prospect of returning to court in the future self-represented. So I'd like to just share that with you. There's a big difference, and I want to thank the council members that are supporting, in particular, 1085 very much, because this is something that is truly needed. I have some other suggestions, but because of the time limitations, I'm going to stop here. Thank you. Um, would you like to put those other suggestions in writing for, to submit, or would you like a meeting, or? Whatever, you, I'd be happy to do both. Okay, great. We, you know, I don't want you to stop talking. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I think part of what, what needs to be done, frankly, is I think the process of marriage and divorce have to be looked at as a whole. I think um, if we examine it thoughtfully, um, there's, um, the process is backwards. Um, I think perhaps if more is done at the beginning, when people first get married, um, and things are set up properly with the anticipation that things may not work out, um, I think it'll be easier and quicker to resolve them at the end. Um, things like, for example, requiring people to disclose when they get married their assets um, and file that so that when people want to leave, it's very clear what they started with, and then you're only negotiating what has been um, created in the interim during the marriage. That's one thing that's an issue. I think also people's attitudes about children, about custody, about what's acceptable in a marriage. Um, for example, um, there should be a manual. What, what, is, what is and isn't allowed? Um, I'm gonna make the example of um, people going for a driver's permit. Um, it's, it's, you, when you go for a permit, there's a booklet that you're given, a very nicely written booklet, um, which is free. And um, you're supposed to read it and take a little um, test before you can get a permit. And then, of course, you have to have lessons and you have to demonstrate your knowledge of the road and your driving ability to get a license. When you go, by contrast, to get married, the only thing you have to fill out, at least when I did, was a one-page form. And that was it. And there was no, there was no book um, explaining to you what was and wasn't allowed. People come to it otherwise from their own life experience with different expectations. And I think people should know from the get-go what they're getting into. Um, it would be very helpful to have some kind of manual, whether it was online or in paper. Um, I also think that um, it would be I, I, all the laws that concern and all the areas that concern um, people when they get married um, you cannot be found in one place. As one matrimonial lawyer said to me, they're all over the place. There's not one legal book I could recommend to you that you could read to know what they are. So things like people's pensions or health care choices, all of these things, are the lay person doesn't have a clue um, what they're getting into when they agree to marry somebody. Mm -hmm. And they have no idea what's involved in getting out of marriage. So I think if there's more input and thought into what we're really asking people to sign when they get married and more information provided and perhaps the input of more lawyers at the start rather than at the end, it would be easier to end unsuccessful abusive relationships. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to my colleagues. Um, good afternoon. My name is Charlena and I'm a survivor of domestic violence. I would like to emphasize survivor as I'm fortunate to be standing here before you to speak with you today. Uh, there are many victims who unnecessarily meet a tragic fate. I'm a member of the Voices of Women, VOW, a grassroots organization of survivors of domestic violence who organize to improve the systems that abuse victims rely on for safety and justice. There are many systems whose response to survivors of domestic violence 
can stand to be improved. However, I'm here to advocate for the passage of once again from June 2017, intro 1610 for OCDV to provide training to cosmetologists on the signs of domestic violence and available resources for its victims and or clients. We recognize the dedication in this revised motion in proposed, in proposed intent number 371A. It's important for us to acknowledge the crucial role that hairstylists can play in a victim's life. They can notice signs of abuse like bald spots uh, where hair once grew or bruises covered by makeup. For many, a hairstylist is a confidant and individuals may disclose an abusive relationship. I agree. I can agree on that from first-hand experience. It is important that cosmetologists re receive the proper training on the effects of abuse, its cycles, and engaging in a victim so that they are able to provide them with information on where to go for help. The information provided to survivors should be clear on next steps as navigating New York City's domestic violence response systems, and, can, and, and that can be extremely confusing. Uh, we recommend that all trainings provided by OCDV include survivors of domestic violence to provide participants in the trainings with a comprehensive understanding of what it means to be a victim of domestic violence, mm -hmm. its cycles, and how, it effectively, how to effectively engage victims of DV from a, from a survivor's perspective. Uh, systems navigation really is key. Uh, cosmetologists are at the ground level to help combat domestic violence and the many forms that it takes. Once again, as Sabra mentioned, it is not a one-size-fits-all solution to solve these complex problems. And yes, it is crucial to continue to explore creative ways of clearing the pathway for safety for survivors of domestic violence. We thank you, Council Members Salamanaka and Rosenthal for supporting this important legislation and thank you for listening. Thank you so much. Everything all of you had to say was so powerful today. Um, we are eager to have your testimony as part of the record. Um, I think, uh, Elizabeth, you provided uh, written testimony. For the others, if you like, we can make a copy of your testimony right at the end of this hearing. Is that okay with you? Yeah. Um, if not, you can submit it electronically, but we really appreciate it. Um, I'm gonna call the hearing to a close. I, I just wanna um, say for the record how much I, I've appreciated this hearing, um, learning from the experts, hearing from survivors and victims, um, and certainly hearing about the administration's efforts to deal with this scourge. Um, you know, upon reflection, we're on the, um, we, we also had a hearing about the NYPD's uh, Special Victims Division that uh, investigates um, rapes, you know, where a, a victim would come forward. And, um, and the total number that come forward is around 5,600. Um, and, and we know that's but five to 25 percent of what really exists out there. But what I was really touched by today is um, when someone mentioned the word rape as part of domestic violence, and that gets lost in the sauce. Um, these types of violations, uh, physical rape, you know, um, of course, everyone suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder and walking around with such burdens on their lives. Um, I, I also, oh, and Council Member Traeger wants to make a closing statement as well. Very brief. Okay, well, why don't you go ahead and then I'm just gonna finish up, please. I, I, I first wanna just really, really commend Chair Rosenthal for 
helping put this all together, and your leadership has been inspiring, um, really on a citywide level, not just here uh, in these chambers. Uh, so I want to thank you and your office and the committee staff for doing an extraordinary job. I want to thank my colleague, Councilmember Ayala. I was actually not aware of her powerful uh, very emotional story uh, as I was working on this legislation, but I thank her immensely for turning her pain into purpose and for sharing uh, something that I believe many folks are also going through experiencing at this time. And I strongly commend you, I support you, we have your back, and we're going to get this done, Council Member. Um, I also recognize as the sponsor of 1085 that advocates and organizations that have been at the front line of this work for so many years have to be front and center at the table, helping make sure that we uh, deal with the technical questions and issues, very valid issues that we've heard here today. Um, but in closing, it's also disheartening to hear from the administration uh, about our current approach to this issue. Because I think the message of today and the message of this uh, uh, awareness month and, and in general every month really about raising awareness has been you're not alone. But the current policy, as we've heard from so many powerful speakers today, is that at the most critical juncture of need, when you need that critical assistance, not just access, but actual representation to secure your freedom in so many different ways and capacities, the message is you are on your own. And that is not acceptable. It's not acceptable, not here in New York. So we will work with advocates, we will work with organizations, we'll work with my colleagues. We will and we must get this done. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Traeger, that was beautiful. I echo your sentiments and am and, and proud to fight alongside of you. I mean, the one thing that um, is so unique about domestic violence is that it really takes all aspects, the, a wide variety of government resources um, to help out. Every moment, I think, is a crisis. Divorce. It's a horrible culminating um, event. Uh, I, I was going to mention that the New York Police Department responds to an average of uh, 650 DV calls a day. Uh, on average, they are investigating 760 DV cases a day, and that they have 450 officers, DV officers. Um, I, I also, you know, just to get to the point of the resources that are needed are much more than what the need is. And that was something I, I'm repeating it back to you, but I'm going to end on your, what I heard in all of your testimony, which was that, uh, the mayor's office of and gender-based violence saves lives every day. Yeah. That's, that's a powerful statement. And if they are not well enough resourced, they are not saving all the lives that need help here in New York City. Um, you know, this notion that the uh, DV staff uh, should should be survivors themselves. You know, this notion of pure delivered service model um, is, is right spot on. And I, I thank you for bringing that up. Um, and of course, the demand for our lawyers and, and for the help, you know, to make sense of, you know, people are at the lowest point. And, and needs city services from every direction, including lawyers. So I want to thank you for staying today. Thank you for your testimony. 
and um, really thank all the council members and the staff for their work. I'm gonna call this hearing to a close.